Good afternoon, good, uh, well, good morning or good evening, depending where you are in the world, for, for joining us for today. Uh, my name is Professor Perry Hobson. I'm based at Sunway University here in Kuala Lumpur, in Malaysia. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce my, my colleagues and co-founders of uh, 30 Minute Talks, Dr. Andy Nazarchuk. Andy, hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Andy Nazarchuk, and I'm happy to be here today to do a little discussion on the status of education considering the global pandemic. That's right. And also to Alan. Hello, yeah, Alan. Th thank you, Perry and Andy. Um, welcome, everybody, all the ICE members. And as always, it's an absolute pleasure to join the ICE colleagues and friends yeah, today at the, uh, today's webinar. Um, uh, I think we've all had a relationship with the ICE over the years, so uh, we, we look forward to sharing some of those comments with you, as well as uh, our thoughts on surviving COVID-19 and what the hospitality and the education industry might look at for the future. Absolutely, and in fact, all of us, in fact, Alan was at the uh, one of the first meetings we had as we revisioned the ICE back in 2008. Alan, that was 12 years ago, think of that, where we were in the then Sheraton Hotel in Perth, uh, trying to work out where things should go as the Australian government, as the then the Australian government funding ended. So Alan was uh, involved with the ICE for, for many years, sat on the board of directors, and uh, Andy has been very involved with the ICE as well as uh, an accreditor, working on our panel of accreditors, uh, having visited many different institutions. So uh, from the three of us who've been long time involvement with the ICE in different forms and capacities, uh, and having been involved in education, hospitality and tourism education, not only in Australia, but across Asia. Dr. Andy and I uh, also worked together at Taylor's University in Malaysia after he'd spent many years in uh, Singapore and before that at uh, UNLV in the United States. Uh, Alan, having run his uh, own school in Perth in Australia for many years and uh, was also on the board of the ICE, worked, as I said, for many years. So uh, a huge amount of uh, hopefully perspective that we can bring and uh, to some of the challenging issues that we see hospitality, tourism, education uh, facing at the moment. So the three of us earlier this year co-founded what's called uh, 30 Minute Talks. And Andy, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, that and uh, some of the things we've been doing through that? You know, it's one thing when the, when the pandemic started back in uh, March, uh, near the end of March is when we got involved and schools started to close down. We decided that there was a need for some type of online uh, education information for students because it, was, it happened so quickly that universities weren't really ready to offer those online classes as much as they are today. So if you think we started 30 minute talks and we have had 33 weekly programs, we've never missed one. We've had speakers, we have different topics. We've had over 5,000 students sign and register and academics sign and visit and watch the show since April. Our average attendance is about 150 to, and we've had, I think the largest was 600 at one time. Uh, and we have uh, quite a few partners and I know Alan's gonna tell us about those partners, right? Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, I'm sure everybody knows, including um, the ICE, that without uh, partners, without collaboration, without uh, people that are like-minded and willing to work with you, n none of these organisations would be would be uh, able to move forward and achieve, I guess, some of the things that we've achieved. So we, we always look, look forward to thanking academic partners. And specifically, what we'd like to mention is thank you also to the ICE for being an academic partner of 30 Minutes and supporting us since the start of, of the 30 Minute Talks. And we've had, you know, various different sessions. <clears throat> uh, so each week we bring in different uh, presenters to 30 minute talks. And uh, as Andy's already mentioned there, we've had now something like 33 different shows. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had Sarah Gardner. I've worked with Sarah, uh, she's based at uh, Griffith University. And uh, she's done a lot of work on reimagining tourism and uh, on crisis management, recovery, those sorts of things. And so she gave a really uh, interesting presentation to us. Uh, that was, uh, I think, two, three weeks ago, wasn't it? Yeah, and all, so all of our videos are available on our website. So if any schools out there want to see our videos, uh, join the website and take a look. And uh, of course, we have a, quite a few attendees today from LPU. So welcome to them. And Perry, I guess you, the, the first question is, I guess you guys start the first question. Yeah, so the first question is going to be, where are, we, where are things going to be going in the future? So are we going to be looking at a world that's going to, things are going to go well, or things that are going to go badly? So Andy, what's your view on how do you think things are going to be going from here? 
I don't think I'm going to talk about this one. I think we'll let Alan take care of this. Yeah, one. I, was, I was going to say, oh, uh, Perry, I, I, I let, I'll let Andy talk about the downside, but let me just share <laughs> with you what, what I think is uh, some of the upsides. So whilst COVID has infected millions worldwide, and uh, I guess sparked fears of the worst recession since the Great Depression, uh, there's been many inadequacies that, inadequacies that have been uh, discovered over the past number of months in leadership, in healthcare, that have sent ripples through society. Um, and I guess as I'm an overall optimist, I like to see a positive upturn and the other side. So let's look at the upside to, to what, what I've seen uh, since uh, March this, this year. I think from a tourism uh, perspective, tourism and businesses have had an opportunity, although it's been a forced opportunity to, to reset, asking fundamental questions. For example, the trend to move from over tourism or mass tourism to a more resilient and sustainable model for the future. What about inclusive or regenerative tourism, for example? And UNESCO has got on their site uh, now that you can join as a sustainable tourism pledge for operators to sign. Uh, I think work patterns have become more flexible. People have been spending more time with families. I think adapting to interpersonal norms, the new interpersonal norms, generally everyone has become a bit more supportive of each other and a bit more tolerant of each other. Um, I think tourism and hospitality businesses and education has had to pivot uh, to cater to, to new markets. So it's been leading to some new strategic thinking and some new innovative thinking uh, as a key for survival. And let's not forget the, the hospitality and tourism industry has really played a lead role in supporting uh, the pandemic response effort. And that's including providing meals uh, in hotel rooms and vouchers for medical staff and all those sorts of things. So I think the hospitality industry itself has been quite immersed in this. And uh, something that sh needs to be said is that I think promoting safe, healthy, COVID safe business operations, businesses have had to develop and implement more robust health and safety protocols. And finally, I think just um, a final point about the world has become a bit more comfortable with technology. And today is a good example of the use of technology. And I think really the COVID has forced to the forefront digital innovations that normally would have taken a lot longer to, to, to be used or adopted uh, that we're now seeing as the normal. What about yourself, Andy? I'm, I'm going on the downside, Alan. You know, the world's got a pandemic, travel is down. Today in the United States, it's Thanksgiving that even though people are not supposed to travel, they had 50 million people on airports traveling on Thanksgiving, getting ready for the holiday. And you think that's a lot of people. No, it's actually 50% less than it was a year ago. So the industry has less people traveling, hotels are having trouble, restaurants are closing, mm -hmm. hospitals are busy, and we're sitting and trying to figure out how we're gonna educate students for the next generation when all everything is in complete turmoil. So today I am gonna be giving my painful strategies when we finish our presentation. And I hope that everybody will listen to those carefully because I think we're gonna to have to really get ready for, for some rough few months coming up uh, in order, as we prepare to reboot, reboot our education industry and the hospitality industry. And with that- Well, look, I'm sitting between, I can see an optim two, 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 two different views of the world where we're going with this, an absolute optimist and an absolute pessimist on things. So I'm gonna take a little bit of the middle turn here. I think that when things do come back, they won't go back. And as Anna's pointed out, you know, do we want to go back to the problems we had in 2019 uh, of over tourism, wringing our hands about the problems we had of too much. So we've gone from over tourism to no tourism. I guess the question is going forward from here, will we value travel a bit more? Will we be thinking more seriously about sustainability issues that we were faced with? And so I'm a bit optimistic, but I think the challenge is gonna be making that change and that mindset change. And uh, there was a very good ask I read recently in the Financial Times talking about pandemic as portal. That you, it's like a time shift portal you've got to go through and, and you remember how things were and you're stuck in that. We want to remember how things used to be, but we're having to deal with the reality of engaging with a world that's very different and has been pointed out that uh, technology and we've got used to doing things in different ways. And so those business trips that people used to take, were they really all that necessary? We just thought they were because that's what we did back then. So the challenge I think is going forward and this is going to be very interesting to see how this plans out and I think for education, we're a little bit in the eye of the storm and changes will be coming. Andy. Actually, you know, there is a storm brewing, Perry. That's no doubt about it. The mm. on. Whatever we've been doing in the past is over. International enrollments 
you know, if you have if you have any dependency on international students, you're in trouble right now. They're dropping in many countries. So how do you refocus in a highly competitive market? That's the big that's the big question for today. You know, if you look at the example, this is just a chart. The one thing that I notice in this chart is in the U.S., for example, and it's representative of a lot of students, that the current young people has has no impact on their interests of where they want to go to school. So if a student, a young person out there wants to go to one particular university, whether it be in Australia or in Malaysia or in the United States, one way or another, they're still going to go there. But the question is, they can't. So that's one of the points, for I think, for today's session is you have to understand that there is still a demand for students for certain universities because of their brand or the way they teach education. But right now there's a disruption in the system and I think we better start getting ready for that. Alan. Yeah, thanks Andy. And uh, I think that the ICE at the moment is working on, dare I say, the student barometer and the international student barometer. And, and I guess that over-reliance or over-dependence on international students is something that, 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 that is part of very much the, the surveys that are undertaken in, in you know, evaluating your students and getting their feedback. But the value of international students is generally not very well explained, in my view, uh, to the public at all. And uh, this is not only true in Australia, but also in many countries that are highly dependent on international students traveling and studying in that country. And it, generally in the past, most times the communities have, have rarely seen international students as being an inconvenience to them. So for example, in 2019, the international education contributed $37.6 billion to the Australian economy. But COVID has rarely shaken the higher, higher education industry in Australia and no doubt everywhere else in the world. We've locked down cities, we've locked down suburbs and homes for a long while now. And for most of 2020, uh, travel has become a thing of the past. So planes have been grounded and international borders have been closed. And this has rarely, rarely affected the, the international students markets. Most universities and education providers have had to make over, overnight transitions into teaching online and offering virtual student support. So if we look at the next slide, I think it's um, a, a, a nice message there to share with you. Uh, in, in this case, a new report by the Mitchell Institute has found that international student crisis in Australia is also causing a population shock. So there's, there's another kick on uh, to, to um, the, the demise of the international students that is at the moment only getting worse. The report estimates that over 300,000 international students, which is half the pre-coronavirus numbers, Will be in Australia by July 2021. So a massive loss in student international student numbers, but also a loss in population. So if travel restrictions remain in place, the pandemic has already cut the number of international students who would normally be in Australia by 210,000. That's taking into account the others that would have travelled since March this year. And international student data shows total enrolments are down by 12% since March 2020. Border closures mean new students are not replacing current students as they finish their courses. And the number of Australian enrolled international students now studying remotely from outside Australia has increased from 116 to 138,000. And I think that supports what you said, Andy, that there's students now that are happy to enroll into courses elsewhere and study from their home country on, on online courses. So the, the, the world is a changing, as has been said. Perry. Yes, it is. And, you know, one kind of the interesting things here working in Malaysia have been, has, has been to see that change. We work very closely with Lancaster University. We have 21 uh, dual degrees with them. So, but this year, what we're beginning to see is that students who would ra rather than go to the UK starting here. And, and one of the challenges for Malaysia as a country has been that, in fact, we had more students studying uh, outside of Malaysia than we were bringing international students in. So the closed board is actually keeping more of those students in the country at the moment. So this is changing the dynamics. We're looking more at transnational education, but what we're also looking at doing is working more closely with the partner, in this case, Lancaster. And they've got campuses in Ghana. They've also got a partner in China. So now we're looking to see how we can cooperate with those other, with the, the network that we've already got there. And that's leading us into discussions about virtual exchange, sharing of teaching staff, uh, we did a virtual visit to Lancaster recently. I couldn't send the students there, so we created a one-week virtual experience instead. So I think there's a range of different things that are happening here, and I think universities going forward are going to have to start to rethink and revision a little bit about what their future is going to look like. So when we, as we've literally jumped in at the deep end into this digital space, so if we'd had this discussion a year ago and I'd said all the ICE members and all the universities in the world will be going digital, I think you'd have told all three of us that we were absolutely crazy. It has happened. So there's going to be no going back to that. I guess the question is going forward, what will that future look like? 
in terms of a blended space, a digital space, a more cooperative and collaborative space, because a lot of that technology is very expensive to do. But also it means we've moved uh, our, our professors and our teaching staff from just being in a walled garden, if you like, uh, within that sort of Apple framework, if you want to use that as an expression, to now being digital professors. They can be anywhere at any time. Andy. You know, I think I think the one thing that we have to look uh, take into consideration is that there is a vaccine coming out, and and while that's a very positive move, how you know the the bigger question is it's going to take months, if not ye a year or more, for that vaccine to cover the, the world and for herd immunity to become uh, a way we can defend ourselves. So the disruption is going to continue for a long time, and I think that uh, Perry's point is well taken. Is we're we're learning how to do things online. And we're getting better at it every day. And are we going to want to go back to the ways we were doing it before? So, Alan, what do you think of that? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's no doubt that the, the changes that have uh, already been put in place and are in motion at the moment, they will, in my view, become the new normal. Um, we talk about the new normal. What does it look like? Well, I think there's no doubt that the, the digital age is here to stay. It's just to, to what extent does that digital age meet with uh, students' needs and students' uh, personal demands in the future uh, as uh, the, the, the digital age and the, the, the digital students starts emerging and um, really how institutions adapt to that. I think it's also important noting that, um, you know, uh, the two bull markets in the world, the, the Chinese market and the Indian market have been the two that have been most affected. So big numbers have been affected for, for, for global markets in the inter international education space and replacing those in the short term, Andy, is, is always going to be a big challenge. Yeah, I think I think I think the next slide is appropriate for the future of education. I know, Perry, you, you're you're the expert in the future. Tell us all about it. <laughs> That's because I do a short course every year at MCI and uh, the future of tourism. And uh, well, what a year that was to, to try and teach that one. So look, I think looking forward and using this particular graphic of virtual reality. Now, um, I actually, funny enough, the other day dug up an article that I'd written 25 years ago about virtual reality and tourism. And, uh, you know, a lot of what we predicted back then, I'll be quite honest, hasn't yet happened. But dare I say, no one at that time saw the massive leaps we've made with mobile technology and other forms of technology which really have moved on. And I think VR or augmented reality day, day will come. And I think for institutions, this is really a, a moment whilst we've been thrown into a situation of, uh, of dare I say, um, uh, trying to work out at this point with the pandemic to cope with that. It, it's been a real shock to the system. This is also giving us a chance to look at the future of education. After all, many other industries have gone through some form of digital disruption, whether it's being the music industry, uh, movies with Netflix, et cetera, et cetera. Dare I say, like Wiley Coyote, we, we've gone over the cliff. We just didn't realize that we were, we were gone too far of that and that finally reality has caught up with the situation. So I think the future of education, we've got to revision it. What is it that people will come to universities, to institutions, to hotel schools, to tourism programs for in the future? And what technology are we going to need to build into this? Now, when we were looking at that, uh, so this work was pulled out uh, um, to look at what students have been saying. And in the US, about a third, 38% said, yes, I'm quite happy to go online. About 32, another third said no, another sort of third said, I'm not sure. So, you know, this is not something the students are saying absolutely not to. Now, of course, online universities have been around for a long time and they haven't been mainstream. And most of us, let's face it, were either contemplating blended, we're doing blended, we were somewhere in that space. I guess the, the question going forward is, are we gonna leapfrog into another space where we're using even more advanced forms of technology, which are there already? The gaming industry, I think, has shown a way forward, and they've been much more early adopters, for example, things like virtual reality. Andy? Uh, you know, actually, I think we'll let Alan tell us about the- Oh, it's Alan, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's fine, Perry. And uh, listen, I, I agree with pretty well everything you said. I think the revisioning is absolutely part of, of uh, what we see here, and we've been talking about online, but I think, you know, in many cases for institutions, it might even be a bigger picture. It's, it's a little bit about looking at 
what might your institution look like in the future and, and how might your institutions adopt it? Uh, I picked up this uh, graphic from a recent report from Ernst & Young on the University of the Future. And their modeling really asks uh, for institutions to imagine moving yourself to the year 2030 into the future. And then uh, in, that, in that scenario, 2030, 10 years down, what, what might the institution or the universities look like? And they've painted four different scenarios. And in scenario one, under the Champion University model, the majority of students enroll in traditional undergraduate and graduate degree programs. And universities streamline their operations by transforming service delivery and administration. And the division between the vocational education sector and the higher education sector remains largely unchanged. So I guess in scenario one, you've got a very similar model to what is currently the, the fact, although there's no doubt that, that there's going to need to be some streamlining in order to make themselves survive. If you look down through, through the modeling, then in scenario two, the commercial university, uh, this requires universities to be financially independent to ease the national budget pressures that have been felt not only in Australia, but across the, across the globe. Education is, is a very, very costly commodity. At the same time, obligations for research have eased. This allows the landscape to become much more diverse with much fewer comprehensive universities and a much greater specialization for providers who can now play to their strengths under this deregulated model, whether that be in research or teaching or subject areas or focus and teaching and learning models or whatever. Students in this case might favor degree programs that offer work integrated uh, learning, for example, and that already is taking place in some of the, the, the institutions now. In scenario three, the emergence of the disruptor university is one that, that interests me. And this is really taking account for a completely deregulated sector that drives competition and efficiency. So in this scenario, continuous learners and their preferences for on-demand micro certificates dominates, and this really allows technology to disrupt the workplace and, and technology, to be, technology to be one of those drivers. Universities in this case will expand into new markets and services and compete against a range of new and local global educational service providers. So it's no longer competition within universities, but it's also competitions with other education providers. And finally, in this, the, the last scenario four, under a complete uh, government restructure of tertiary education sector to integrate universities and the vocational sector into, into one, prioritizing training and employability outcomes as human beings begin to re be replaced by technology, which is a question and a, I guess something that, that uh, we can explore later on. Continuous learners are the majority. They prefer unbundled courses delivered flexibly online. In this scenario, universities restructure completely into networks that share digital platforms in that encompass uh, the sharing of research, encompass the sharing of learning and teaching resources, and, and the encompassing and sharing of, of faculty and staff. So I guess the, 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 those models have all got uh, various benefits and uh, downsides. You know, Alan, you know, if, if you think about it, if you think of the history of education, let's go back a couple hundred years or if, you know, two, you know, we had apprenticeship program. Everybody went, became an apprentice to learn how to do something, universities far and few between. So where are all those apprentice programs now? They disappeared because there was a disruption in the way things were education happened. So today, will there be universities in the future? Because right now, what do students want? They don't want to, I don't think they like going online, but students over the years have been very accustomed to the student experience they want to they want to meet other people they want to network they want to do things on campus they want to get away from their homes they want to travel all those things are part of the educational process and that's actually something that that as you mentioned i think the universities are going to have to adapt to perry well i think you're actually right and i think that the um you know we're going to have to work out what is going to be the student experience and with many, many uh, countries around the world having loaded up with a lot of debt during this COVID pandemic, as this goes forward, although everyone's saying, oh, debt's cheap at the moment, you know, it's still going to have to be paid back. And I think a lot of countries will be faced with substantial budget challenges as, as we go forward into this space. So I think, you know, that means various public services and education will be one of them will be, will be fighting for that dollar. So the question, I think, as we head into this is, well, institutions have enough of the resources, whether it's in terms of human resources, capital intensive resources, uh, cash resources to do the IT that would be deliver on that. And if they don't, how can you find out and work collaboratively to develop that? And as we've gone, as I mentioned before, from closed systems, like the Apple, if you like, part of the wall garden, to more open systems. 
Now, if we go back way, well, well, well back in time to say the traditional Oxford College, there was only one door into the college, one way in and one way out. And some people questioned that whether that was to keep the students in or to keep the, 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 the town out of the situation. But it was very much a walled environment. With now with the digitalization that opened that up substantially. And then that begs the question at the moment, we have credit courses. Once you start talking about micro credentials, and then we touch, start talking about scaffolding, you know, can we take different subjects from different places? Now, some institutions absolutely agree with you, it's about the student experience. So if I'm gonna to go to an institution, it's not just for the academic, it's a sense of community, it's a sense of growing up. There's a whole range of other, you know, things that come together in that. But many institutions may say, well, I don't need to offer absolutely everything is the day of this massive comprehensive university. Australia, as Alan would know, has got 45 um, uh, business schools. Do you need 45 business schools all teaching and delivering the same thing? They've all got marketing, 101, accounting, 101, et cetera, et cetera. That's a good point, Perry. Really starts a good question. Question from Oswin, who's asked, so asking Alan, where, where is the innovation from inside your model? The model, you, you know, what, what is the big innovation that we're gonna see uh, compared to universities? Yeah, listen, uh, and thanks very much, Osman, for, for the question. Um, for, for me, no doubt, uh, first of all, the, the, the industry having to strategically look at itself and, and create a new vision, uh, as Perry has mentioned, that, that really meets the, 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 the students' future demands and needs uh, is, is already, in my view, uh, very innovative. I, I think in many instances, uh, the education sector has been quite... Um, Static. It's probably we've, uh, the, the education industry, in my view, has probably been one of the last uh, industries to move. Uh, it, it's still very traditional, as we're saying in this in this uh, conversation right now, and that adopting new innovations, adopting new technologies, changing the the traditional business model to something that is different. And I'm not sure exactly what that's going to look like. I think just in strategically looking at what the new business model might be is already part of the innovation that we're talking about. And who knows what will come out of that? I, I don't think. Um, the fact that you know we've travelled since March until what November this year, uh, as a, as a um, function of COVID and the impacts of COVID, has really given us the true solutions. But I think the fact is that there is change about at the moment, and that change is is creating new strategic thinking and new innovation, and um, uh, no doubt that will most likely result in new innovative models in the education sector. And Alan, actually, we just got a, quite, a, a very nice statement from Tom, Tom Baum, who's uh, to talk about we have to gain confidence and trust in the future of tourism and hospitality. And they just completed a study, uh, but they're looking at the, the negative over, undertones of job losses, safety issues over the same period. So how do we demonstrate to key stakeholders that students do have a meaningful future in tourism and hospitality? Perry, what do you think? Well, look, that's a really good one, Tom. And, uh, you know, that's something I think that we recognize very early on in the piece. And that was really part of the discussion the three of us had about why we ended up with 30 minute talks. Was we saw an industry that was at the forefront of just having to stop, stop, literally stop dead. And the implications that would have. And I think for any industry, as this change comes along, you can be part of the, the damage, you can be the collateral damage in, in, in what is happening in that. And clearly, as we go out of this pandemic, um, hopefully with the vaccine, as Andy said, which will, will be delivered, but it will take time to roll that out. You know, some of the digital changes have jumped us forward. And so some of those, what I call transactional jobs, will not exist anymore. And I think that's going to be the interesting thing is to understand where that will be. And of course, people will look at the industry in, in new ways. We'll see it as a much riskier industry, perhaps. I don't know. But then again, many other industries are going to also be changing significantly too. So we're not alone in that. And I think when it comes to meaningful futures, um, you know, we, we're going to have to align ourselves with a lot of other issues of, such as environmental concerns, et cetera, to be seen as a good industry again as well. Actually, you know, that's a, uh, that's a good lead into our, our next uh, slide here. And actually, what is the future of the industry realistically going to look like? And so if you say, you know, right now, there's a big focus on health. Obviously, everyone has to learn sanitation and how to handle customers with considered a COVID. 
there's less mass tourism. I think that's a key thing for our industry is now people are looking for high wealth individuals. They're looking for less people to come to their destinations so that they can have more social distancing to protect them. And again, I think your point's correct, Perry, high tech. You know, if you go into a store these days, you no longer pay cash. You're using digital, whether it be a credit card or a debit card or a cryptocurrency, which is starting to happen. All those things are more high tech. So the, the evolution is changing. And I think we mentioned it in 30 minute talks the other day where maybe the customer will be able to demand having a real person at the front desk rather than going into an automated hotel. That might be the value proposition that the industry might start to offer is having real people in the store instead of having robots. So let's take, let's take a look. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit, Alan. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, I think absolutely you're right. Uh, with the movement to more high tech, um, there's no doubt that that will change the industry, but I think it will also have uh, significant impacts on the education industry. Um, Self-directed mobile learning um, could really, in my view, form the core of form, the, the very core of uh, formal education models in the future. And I say that because uh, whether that's through adaptive learning apps, one-on-one uh, -on -one blended learning models, uh, more personalized learning and, and using learning algorithms to personalize education, or even the self-directed learning that we're speaking about, enabling uh, the user to access learning at a time that's convenient to them at their fingertips on their mobile device um, is, is, is significant in, in terms of um, uh, transforming the education industry. So the future of learning for me is no doubt, un or undoubtedly mobile, uh, personal and self-directed. But whether it's effective or not depends on exactly what has been personalized. So institutions, if, if they may, and if I, I can suggest this, in many instances might need to get out of the way and focus on, stu on students how to learn rather than what to learn. And I think that's a significant shift in, in education for the future. Mm -hmm. Self-directed and mobile learning uh, movements allow for much greater rationalization of industry needs and student demands of the future. And, and, and I think this has really been not only driven by the change brought about by COVID, but I think it's definitely been brought about by the, the uh, digital student of the future. Well, and that leads right into our next topic there, the collaboration. I think that's, this is probably one of the key, most important points of the session. Uh, why don't you start off with this? Tell us about collaboration, Alan. Thanks, Annie. So if we're suggesting that every institution needs to go online in the future and that self-directed and mobile learning uh, is going to be a key to the future successes of education, then this poses a key question. Do all universities, as Perry was saying a moment ago, or higher education institutions or providers need to teach all the subjects? So. Uh, I think Perry mentioned across 45 universities, do you need 45 business schools that all teach introduction to marketing, introduction to business, introduction to whatever it may be? And um, some of the views might be um, a little bit different in that respect. Let's have a look at the next slide because I think this really links to um, uh, 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 comments about whether you, you, you optimize or you transform. So this, this little graphic comes from KPMG in the report on the future of higher education. Uh, in a disruptive world. And they suggest that many universities and higher education institutions around the world are fast approaching crossroads uh, that will define their future in terms of strategy and operating models. And the key questions that they will be asking are, do they need to completely transform? Uh, meaning, do they need to significantly change their strategic, strategic ambitions or fundamentally shift their value propositions or their, their business models entirely? Or do they optimize, which is requiring them to improve organizational effectiveness and efficiencies in order to improve overall performance and meet the new strategic ambitions? Or do they do nothing and react later? Or I guess they've got another choice. Do they do nothing and face the inherent risks of their inaction? So um, there, there is some key questions that have been asked about, do you need to transform or optimize? Or again, do you do nothing or do you react, react later? So KPMG in this report indicates that for the majority of the institutions that um, uh, we, we know today, the realistic choice likely falls between, between transforming and operating and all that goes along with this. And in order to, to actually put that into place in a, re a reasonably short per uh, uh, period of time, effectively you can achieve transformation through slow optimization is effectively what they're saying. That is optimizing while taking the risk of fresh disruption, upending them in the meantime. So those institutions that transform uh, more rapidly will more than likely be the ones that will last the longer. And those that optimize and take their time over a transformation period run the risk of, of being beaten to the, 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 the closing or the finishing line. 
So whether you select to transform or optimize, the building blocks are effectively the same from, from a business modeling perspective. That is reviewing your strategy, your mission and your purpose, improving your core capabilities, whether that be research, teaching, learning, collaboration, internationalization, whatever it might be, or all of the above. Uh, whether you adopt a target operating model and understand very clearly what your operating model is, or you adopt and you modernize technologies throughout the institution. So I think um, it's, it's, it's a, a nice way of putting into place uh, some of the, the um, choices that institutions will face in the future, Andy. Yeah, I think, you know, Perry topic. you said that Oxford only had one door. So how, the question is, how long did it take for them to add the second door and what motivated them to do it? You know, did it take five years, a hundred years? So, you know, that's sort of an example of you got to, everybody's got to have to change and uh, learning about technology is the key. Perry? Well, just to go back to the Oxford and, and Cambridge situation, for many hundreds of years, there weren't allowed to be any other universities in the UK. So the government tightly controlled it. And then only a couple of hundred years ago, decided, oh, we, we better allow more institutions to come in. So, you know, again, we're very tightly regulating education in many parts of the world as well. Again, that begs back to an earlier point that Alan made there about, you know, will things open up even further? So when we digitalize things and you can make things much more available, and, you know, obviously we can get all that content. And, and even several years ago, my daughter said to me, well, dad, I don't need to go to university anymore because there's Google. Now, interestingly, my youngest one has just finished her high school. She's very keen to go to university and wants face-to-face. -face. Now, not ex I think in the discussions with her, it's not the only thing she's expecting the university to give her. So again, she's looking for a blend at that age. So again, I think there's going to be differences between different levels of courses, whether we're talking vocational, uh, whether we're talking bachelor's, master's, PhD, et cetera. Those, there will be significant uh, differences and, and challenges there. But my hunch is, as we go forward in, into this, dare I say, newer space on that, and again, going back to this transformation, the question will be, you know, as governments allow institutions to max and match, max mix and match to cooperate, we're going to see much more of that happening because institutions, I don't believe, will have enough resources to be able to keep doing everything they're doing at the moment. Yeah, you know, I think that's a good point, Perry. You know, if you look at you look at a chart like this, you know, a lot of universities take advantage of those key markets, China, India, and they say, oh, we let's go get more of those students. I think I think universities have to redefine who their markets really are. And today your domestic market is one key. And you have to look at it two ways. If let's say you have, you want students coming from Italy. Well, they can't come right now or they won't come right now. So you're gonna have to have a collaborative relationship with a school in Italy to teach those students there for at least one year so that they can come to get the, the, the final degree from your university in Australia. But Australia has to do the same thing for them. So Perry, your exchange programs, those virtual exchanges, those, those collaborative relationships are key to the success in the future. If you're trying to compete with other universities today, you're gonna to be left out in the dark. So working together, sharing information and helping each other survive through these tough times is gonna be a key towards uh, the future of education. Uh, those that don't and try to compete, I think they're gonna be, they're gonna be gone by, by in another year. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about that in my, in my yeah. full strategies that are coming up pretty soon. Well, I, I think Andy, that uh, this is where the space we're heading into. And then the question, the next, that begs the next question, who to collaborate with. And collaboration often comes with people you trust. And it's working together with people that you trust so that you can find that common baseline. I think that's when organizations like the ICE, because we've got accredited institutions, there is a trust between them. Uh, that becomes something that becomes very, very important. It's, it's a very both tangible, but also intangible thing because if you're developing partnerships going forward, you've got to have that. You know, actually- uh, Which brings us, yeah. Yeah, our next, actually our next slide is actually talking about the future. And, and I'm gonna start with the bottom one. Will HAL be in charge? You, everybody remembers the 2001 Space Odyssey? Well, in the United States, just this last week, I, it has to be on the news around the world, in the middle of the desert, in the middle of some remote mountains, they found a 
15 foot metal monolith. Have you, if you haven't seen it, go online and find it. And so the 2000, the future is the future. Maybe we are in the, the future is already here that we just don't know it. But one interesting story about 2001 about missing opportunities. Do you know why the computer in 2001 Space Odyssey was named HAL? Because the producers asked IBM to be the co company that supported their movie and IBM said no. So they backed off one letter and said H-A-L, which it should have been IBM. And that's why it was named HAL in that movie. Just a little little histor little <laughs> trivia for those people that want to know about ah. You go look online for that monolith. It's, it's amazing. And there is no reason for it to be there. Absolutely no reason. Mm. Perry. Yeah, look, I think uh, as, as, as we've already hinted at in today's discussion, you know, how we, what's the future of this going to look like? And, and some people can either take fairly um, clear propositions that they think that things will be much more online and that will be definitely the future. So to go the rest of it, there's this, this question about blended and, and is so what blend? And the, the pandemic has answered these questions. When, when I uh, ch changed institutions, I remember having a discussion not even 12 months ago as to why we were doing no online. And I was told bluntly, students and parents want face-to-face. -face. That's what they're paying for. So even my suggestion about us doing one week of uh, online blended learning, I was sort of slapped around the head. Now, literally three months later, the whole institution had to, to go online. So the question is gonna be, where are we going to be going forward in terms of the blend that is going to characterize the next level? And I think different institutions will have different choices by listening to the students as what is gonna work for them. So yes, many students do wish to travel and study internationally, absolutely. And different things will work for different types of students, as well as I mentioned earlier for different levels, whether it's vocational, bachelor's, master's, et cetera. The question will be getting that blend and that mix right for each institution. Now, as the technology comes, comes in and you know, with my other hat on, I, I attend all sorts of other different conferences. I was at uh, one called Edutech. And, and even last year, they were, they were talking to pharmacists and pharmacists had come up with game technology using virtual reality to run a pharmacist. And you've got doctors who are doing operations, even in the real world, they're doing operations remotely between countries and continents. So the training of that has also gone that way. So will our training restaurants of the future be virtual reality? So these sorts of issues will become very real issues for education as we move forward. So the blend is going to be going to be critical in that. Now, as in terms of these two other issues we've got here with micro credentials, in the case of Malaysia, they suddenly again, COVID has spurred this on and suddenly that has now been approved. I think a lot of institutions have really not fully understood the, the way they've done their micro credentials. They've just basically done a salami. And I'm not entirely sure that this is where either a lot of education has envisioned this, but basically we're just cutting things up into little, little pieces. And then assuming that everyone is still going to do the whole chunk of it. So again, I think there's going to have to be some revision about what we really meant by those, those uh, micro credentials. But do students want certificates? You bet. So three of us know, and we'll talk a bit about that later, lots of students want to get certificates for having attended our 30 minute talks. That really went off much more than we had expected. So they think we clearly want that. Now, when it comes to education, teachers and chatbots, this is gonna pose us with some interesting questions. As students are gonna learn both in a synchronous and asynchronous mode, will we now find that that's going to be the future of how we're going to, to trade things forward? Already, I've been in discussions with, with, with an institution that we're looking, an organization to work with to take our masters online. And the, and the tutor for that weren't even going to be belonging to Sunway University. That particular organization who works with a lot of different universities, by the way, not just with Sunway, but that particular institution has said, well, don't worry, we will come up with subcontracted tutors. Now, if you're going to do that, what's going to be the next level? Many of us are already just as comfortable when we're talking to businesses all around the world are already using chatbots. That friendly little person that's helping us with your airline or your banking isn't really a person at all. So I think, again, there's going to be some technological challenges that we're going to have to start thinking through as well when education starts going in those directions. 
Okay. How? <laughs> well, on, on, on that on that background, uh, Perry, uh, I'm, I'm going to pick up on a few things. I remember uh, uh, speaking at uh, one of the APAC CRE conferences some time ago, and, and uh, I was speaking about the notion of uh, students as consumers. And I think uh, today, um, uh, the response or the questions that I, I received at that time, uh, maybe that particular person that'll go unnamed, might, might have a slightly different thought. I think there's much, much more of a realisation as universities and educational institutions reform that students are consumers, students do have choice and students are making choices that suit their particular needs, lifestyle, uh, location and so on. And I think uh, one of the major drivers of global change uh, and uh, that's reshaping the world in the 21st century and no ed education institution uh, is, is immune to this. The fourth industrial re revolution, a fusion of exponential technologies where uh, silicon and carbon meet will prove to be as profound as the previous industrial revolution, uh, which is driven by steam, electricity and computing. Um, the ability for an institution to transform will be critical for all education institutions uh, to cultivate so they can shape and respond to the changing world of education and absolutely, in my view, to the changing needs of students and, and the student as a consumer. Let's have a look at the next slide, uh, Andy, if you don't mind. So I'll share with you some of my thoughts. Um, as part of this transformation, and with the pr proliferation of social media, I think, abundant product information, online purchasing and the ability to switch preferences quickly, students or the consumer authority or power is becoming a stark reality. So students are in the driving street, uh, uh, seat and have been for some time now. No educational institution can ignore providing uh, and monitoring customer experience. And in this graphic, customer experience is noted as the CX and the, the sector is starting to see this in the university sector as well as uh, across the private sector. The, the KPMG report where this graphic comes from shows how customer experience in educational institutions might also be developed in a more complex idea of the student experience, adding in learning the, learning, the learner experience and also the provision of a personalized experience. So the age of the customer demands might be uh, well represented by the student experience being a combination of, of, of all of that. These are some of the consumer forces that face higher education institutions in the future. Let's have a look at the, the, the next one, uh, Andy. As uh, I guess in order to survive the, the, this changing landscape uh, of these changing customer demands, I'm going to list a couple of the key strategies being suggested by KPMG and um, Ernst Young in, in their reports, and also some of the things that we've learned over the last 33 shows of, of, of uh, 30 minute talks and share those with you in the next few slides and I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. In relation to strategy, how much depends on varying views of the future, depending on your own context. So I guess a possible view of the future of a higher education sector may, however, have some of these, these, these features. So the future of higher education, in my view, is borderless. Universities, higher education institutions and, and other competitors will be offering programs within territories that until now have been assumed normally in their competitors catchment areas and the opportunities for all institutions to do exactly the same. So what might have been your traditional markets, what might have been your traditional students are now everybody's students and all institutions are competing in a global marketplace without borders. This effectively means increasing overseas offshore delivery as cultural and regulatory assist, uh, resistance diminishes. And I think that's key that uh, those changes will also need to be put into place as those uh, resistances diminish to programs that are offered online by foreign institutions. So the more foreign institutions uh, get involved in, in, in this space and the more programs are online, I think that marketplace opens up even more substantially. Let's have a look at the next one. Short, uh, short courses and degrees, um, I think is absolutely a, a demand at the moment. Fewer students are predicted to want to undertake full service degrees. However, more students will be interested in the micro-credentialing that, that we've just been speaking about the competency-based education models, nano degrees and curated degrees. So unbundling of courses will be prominent with tuition fees in the future most likely being itemized. And uh, there's been a question about, well, how do you re revisit the, um, the fees structures uh, for institutions? So in, in, in one of the, the, the arguments, it might be that in itemizing tuition fees, they could be uh, posed as separately for the teaching component uh, another fee for the campus experience component. If the, the student does want a campus experience, they might have, have the added uh, uh, cost of the library or you want to access uh, resource and teaching facilities. 
and so on. So the, the unbundling of the, the courses could also be, mean the unbundling of fees and students as when you go shopping, pick and pay. Students will be able to opt out of some of the aspects of university life and not pay for them. And this might uh, counter the argument that's being used now. We're paying for a university experience, but all we are getting is an online experience. So as this proportion grows of young people who are digital natives with good access to connectivity, in my view, interest will grow in the borderless education and the new kinds of short or longer degrees. And I think they'll become much more popular. Um, if effectively, Finally, institutions will also need to be cognizant of lifestyle integration. I think it's really important that uh, institutions move with the times and recognize that the future student uh, has very different needs. It is most likely that we'll see the cohort of digital natives seeking immersive, uh, rite of passage, full-time, on-campus, bachelor education. This will reduce as a proportion of the total student body that are currently studying. More students will be working part-time, they'll be undertaking family responsibilities, wanting to integrate learning into their lives, want to be safe in the case of, of uh, a scenario where the vaccine is not effect as effective as we're all hoping it is. And in many cases, those students also will want an immersive experience. So these are just a few of the strategies that I suggest institutions really need to consider to survive in the future. And as noted before, business models can become transformative or they can optimize their business models. Either way, change is required in the new normal. Thank you for your time, guys. Over to you, Andy. Okay, and you know, Alan, that those, those strategies are very good. I'm going to give my strategies, and I know Perry's going to give his strategies at the end here. So let me go through my painful strategies to survive during the global pandemic. You know, the global pandemic is just the beginning. Next is the economic pandemic, because right now the global economy is suffering. So my advice is step number one for universities, and even personally, I'm going to say some of these things for personal is cut costs. It's you, you know, you gotta, you gotta save every penny during these tough times in order to survive. What's step number two, cut more. You know, you're gonna have to make some painful decisions in the next six months until the, the world starts getting that vaccine and people start getting out again. It's just not gonna happen overnight. So reducing salaries, unfortunate, but true. And so it's a key of shortening work weeks, offer people instead of a full time, say instead of five days, work four days. And so you get a longer weekend, but you're getting, you're uh, supplementing and helping keep everybody working. So the goal is not to get rid of people. The goal is to keep everyone. That's always my, always been my goal in business. Travel budgets, forget it. If you can't do it on Zoom, don't do it at all. Close low use facilities. You know, if you have buildings on your campus that are not being fully utilized, then you might have to consolidate. Now these, and then you have to evaluate every expense that a school has, every expense you personally have in order to decide what can we do without for a while. And this is not something that every school is gonna be able to do, but these are some drastic steps that I think uh, we, got, we better start thinking about. And now locking down, as you know, Perry, I think we should go back to that Oxford format, one door in, one door out. <laughs> And I was in China during SARS the first time many years ago, and I was at a university teaching there for a short time. And they said, you're on campus, you stay on campus. You leave campus, you do not come back. So that was one way that they controlled the environment for that particular university. And if students break a rule these days, you know what? You're out of here. Uh, you're gonna have to create a university bubble. And the university bubble means that you're gonna have to be able to tell parents that, our university is a safe place for your kids. That's what parents want. That's what kids want. Kids don't, the young people don't worry about it as much as the parents. But if you tell a parent that you have a safe campus, they'll be happy to pay for it. And quarantining students. So this is where you might have to work with that local hotel that doesn't have a good occupancy. Put the students in there, quarantine them. And when they pass the quarantine, you bring them on campus. And in some schools around the world, they're testing regularly. In fact, in Harvard, they're actually testing every three or four days. Students get to self-administer a COVID-19 test, which I think is amazing. Uh, contact Tra tracking apps. We've done a couple of programs on that in 30 minutes. Singapore, Hong Kong has uh, the that you use your phone to contact tracing. That's another thing for you. If you had a case on campus, you want to know what classes was that person in, who did they think, and you want that to happen automatically, automatically. And so, if you can set up a policy at your school to freeze everything, we had an incident. Everybody stay where you are until we figure out who is in contact. So all these policies and procedures are the kinds of things that you have to develop and enforce to get that business back. Now, on the other hand, students wanna have a good time. 
They want to meet new people. That's what I think, Alan, I agree with you that people are going there for that student experience. But that means you have to let them have parties. You have to have fraternities. You have to have bars. And you know what? If they're on campus, you can make a lot of money with a bar or with a young crowd. So there's nothing wrong with that because it's in a controlled environment. And that's what you're going to have to do in order to provide that experience that students really want. As we move on, you know, Alan, you mentioned it too, that parents are not happy with uh, off paying full fees for online courses. Why would I pay the same fees for an online course and not get the college experience? Makes no sense to me. So you're gonna have to offer more for less. You're gonna have to give students, more, take 10 classes for the price of one. Whatever you have to do to keep students motivated, the, the co comparison I can give everyone is when you used to go on a cruise on a cruise ship as a as a guest, they would charge you for Wi-Fi. They would charge you for every drink. They would charge you for this if you wanted to pay. You had to pay for everything. Go ahead and go online and book a cruise today. You're going to get free Wi-Fi. You're going to get free drinks. You're going to get free everything because they want you to come back on that cruise. And once you come back, that sets the motion for a growth in the future. If people leave and don't come back, and that's the same for a university, then you're in trouble. So the global economy is suffering at all levels. We're all going to be suffering because the economy is hurting. Businesses are down. Retail is down. Education is down. Travel is down. Hotels are having trouble. There is no easy way out of this. I think we're all going to have to help each other reduce costs and help each other be successful as we get through this pandemic. Now, the last one I have is collaborate or die. And I mentioned this before, I used to run the AD, AD American degree program at Taylor's University, which was a two plus two. He did two years in Malaysia, two years in the US. That's the kind of thinking that I think everyone has to have these days is whether it be one plus three, one half plus 10, I don't care what combination you have, but you're gonna have to share online courses and you're gonna have to be creative to work together. If you don't work together and allow students to do these sort of exchanges and two plus two programs, then students are gonna say, let's take a year off, let's wait till this is over and your school is gonna have problems with, with the revenues. So Perry, why don't you tell us about, uh, why, don't you, uh, why don't you tell us what you think and finish up our, our comments for the day. Yeah, will do. Can, Andy, can I just, uh, can you just switch the screen uh, off so I can just share my, um, can you do that? We in business? Here we go. Here we go. Excellent. Okay, good. I, I, <clears throat> to, to pick up on that whole point about a collaboration there, I think this is going to be the challenge going forward. Can you see that okay? Yes. Excellent. Good. So I think the challenge is going to be what sort of collaboration. So if we've got a network of partners, let's say through the ISOR, you know, how do you want to do that? Do you want a very close form of collaboration? Do you want a bigger form of collaboration? Now, finding the, the right fit partner internationally can be very challenging. Um, not everybody is, is intimately compatible, but there may be different ways that you can find and different uh, um, ways that small institutions can work with big institutions. So big institutions may not want a particular area. You might be able to be the specialist in that area for that institution if you are the specialist. So I think looking forward to, to some of these things, we're, we're, we're seeing you know, a difference in terms of what's possible. So some universities have gone for very deep relationships. So for example, uh, Warwick University in the UK and Monash have got a very deep relationship. They share courses. They have pro vice chances at each university. They have joint faculty appointments between the two institutions. Uh, it's a very deep relationship. Mainly, I should say, built about research, but also embodies many other things uh, as well. You find other institutions which have gone into wider networks. There's what's called Universitas 21, which is probably the better known, but there's many other institutions that are out there where you can actually take courses from different institutions within this network to contribute to your degree. So could there be an ICE one, for example, where different students move those, those credits? Um, other, as I said, there's many other different types. Of them. Most of them are quite small, seven, eight institutions. University S21 has about 28 now, so that's a little bit different. There are some slightly bigger ones, but again, the bigger ones tend to be less, uh, less close in terms of their linkages. Now, already we've seen other models, and this is one some of us are familiar with in hospitality and tourism, where students move between the locations. Now, this works perhaps for some students in a highly mobile world, that's fantastic if you can move between Switzerland, Hong Kong, and the US or whatever. 
And that certainly works for a market of some students who want to get those different global experiences. But it's expensive. Uh, it doesn't necessarily fit for everyone. But in a digital age, can we rethink how we do that? So when we're looking at, at having those resources online, already there are networks out there. There's what's called the Virtual Exchange Program Network. This network's about three or four years old. Interestingly, mainly made up of top universities, uh, such as ANU in Australia, uh, Ecole Polytechnic de Lausanne in Switzerland, um, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, Leiden, Adelaide, Vanagon, etc. Now, within this network, and I should point out, virtually none of these institutions are a specialist in virtual online learning. So when they got into this several years ago, this was quite a challenge for them. But what they, what they wanted to do is to find a way. So in this network, students can take credits from each other's institution within that. And so I think there are some ways forward and there's many different subject areas that you can see that it's being done in. So it's not like a particular, just that one area. In fact, this works across a number of different areas. So I think looking into that because it's about us accepting that there's a new normal and it's about us engaging with it, I think, as a, a, as a way forward. Okay, I'll just unshare that. Perry, if I can just add some some comments to that, because I think you're absolutely right. And I think uh, what's been suggested there is there's fantastic opportunity for the ICE members in the future to look at look at uh, the sharing of resources where, where that might be applicable and suitable uh, to their specific business models. But also um, to, to look outside of the education sector and set up relationships and partnerships with, um, for example, movie producers and movie companies, whether they be large or small really um, uh, maximizing the benefits that are out there in terms of technology. If you really want to get into the online space, you want to create world leading resources, then you might need to look at the, the, the sorts of things that movie studios are doing. Um, you mentioned before the gaming industry, as an example, um, starting to work with gamers, bringing them in to develop the, you know, the, the, the virtual uh, reality, the augmented reality, and all the benefits that come with that. Because one of the questions that's come up from uh, one of our participants today is, um, you know, the age old question, how do you deal with replacing um, laboratory subjects, for example, and um, what, what are your thoughts there? Andy, you got any thoughts on that? You know, actually, in our business, the, the, the benefit is that there are hotels and restaurants all over the city where your school is. So if it's open, you better send your students there to volunteer to help uh, help that restaurant and learn from the restaurant that's trying to survive through this this experience. Uh, yes, you can do a lot of things online, but until until you're in an actual situation where you got to make decisions, you got to handle the stress, you got to take care of customers, you have to solve problems. All those things you you know are, you can try to do online, but until you're in the real life situation, it's just not the same. So I think working with the industry not only helps the industry, but develops a closer relationship with the university, and the students will have the opportunity. The other thing, and we've said this in the past, if you're learning how to cook, well, you better start cooking at home. If you're learning how to clean, you better have a clean house. You, you know, in other words, the housekeeping is housekeeping. It doesn't matter what building you're in. All those kind of things, if you, you have to be self-motivated, you have to be self-disciplined in order to create an environment that allows you to manage your own world so that when those skills that you do when you're managing your own personal self and your environment that you can take with you when you go to get a real job. Perry? Look, I, I think there's going to be huge uh, advantages. And I, I made the point earlier about, um, you know, doctors now doing operations outside of the country. And, uh, you know, an example of someone, uh, one of my neighbours here who went to a hospital and they she was given two prices. One was for the human doctor and one was for the robot doctor. The interesting thing was the robot was more than the human because it was more accurate. Mm -hmm. But the issue was with the amount of capital infrastructure for the technology at this point. Now, but of course, technology becomes scalable. And I think these are the, some of the things that we're gonna be looking at, both the industry is gonna be looking at and uh, education will be looking at. Because one of the challenges often with education and particularly with, when it comes to technology, as we've seen with Google and, and um, uh, the, many of the big, bigger companies, Microsoft, Apple, it's, it's a winner takes all situation. So these are gonna be the challenges I think going forward with working with those. And obviously there are many parts of the world where we don't necessarily want people to have access to education. 
good quality education affordably so that that will help uh, as we go forward in what will be quite trying economic times, I think, as we come out of this pandemic. Alan. Thanks, Barry. Absolutely. And um, I'd like to go back to a, a comment from Oswin uh, a little earlier on in the, in the Q&A panel. Um, we, we, we noted this, this the notion of less mass tourism. And his question is why? Maybe just wishful thinking. It appears to be a mantra these days. There's no doubt that it's a bit of a catchphrase. Is it an effect or a deliberate strategy? The reality is use assets or huge assets are available nowadays. Um, and how will they be used if, if we reduce, if we go from a mass tourism to a more elite tourism model? Planes, accommodation, hotels, all this infrastructure that's, that's sitting there now. What are your thoughts about that, Perry? Well, I think it's been a couple of things that are interesting. One is that the, um, the, the, the big planes have actually now been de decommissioned. Uh, British Airways got rid of 31 747s, Qantas have retired its fleet. Uh, Airbus A380s, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how many of them actually get back into the air. So obviously there were some cost issues there, um, though the cruise industry has gone the other way. The ships there uh, retiring, I was listening to the CEO of Carnival last night, and basically they are already decommissioned 18 ships, but they're actually decommissioning the smaller ones. Now, largely that's because their newer ones are the ones they put all the money into, and obviously they're, they're thinking they may not only half fill them. So I guess the question going forward there, Osman, is a couple of things. One is, will this pandemic just politely end as it did 100 years ago? Now, the 1920s was a great economic period. It was known, not known as the Roaring Twenties for nothing uh, until 1929, obviously, in a fairly fateful day there when the, the stock market fell off its cliff. And that led into a very depressing time afterwards. But the time after that, obviously a world war and then a pandemic was actually a very good time economically. People obviously wanted to do lots of things. And I suspect that as we come out of this pandemic, there's also gonna be a lot of pent up latent demand as well. However, I think we're also recognizing the environmental constraints of what we've done. Now, no one was able to stop tourism completely before. It was impossible. If you've been the mayor of Barcelona and said, I'm not going to allow any more tourists in, Venice tomorrow, none. We've now seen you can stop it. So the question is going to be going forward now is that we know what too much looks like. We know what too little looks like. So as is with the three bears, where's the Goldilocks? What's the just right? And I think that will be the challenge going forward. And it's been a question that many, both government, industry have always wanted to dodge going forward. But the overhang of this will always be, is it not this pandemic, will be another one. Remember, there were many knocks on the door before COVID arrived with SARS and MERS, etc. So whether it's uh, what we've seen in Denmark with Minx or we've seen in France with uh, another one that's appeared, uh, these are going to be challenges where whether we like it or not, humans tend to be the main uh, people who facilitate the movement of any of these diseases. So yeah. being around a lot of people may not be a good idea in the future. Well, I'm going to say, you know, I, I was involved with a project years ago where they built a hotel on a little island and it didn't work out. So the, the question was, what do we do at a hotel if it's not a hotel? Well, storage facility, uh, retirement home, hospital, uh, fishing, store your fishing gear there. You know, in other words, uh, we better be, we better, there's a lot of cruise ships for sale if you want to buy one, a lot of hotels for sale, a lot of restaurants for sale. And I agree with Perry that uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of people that will, that will, grab those deals because they see growth in the future. And I hope that's true for all of us. And I think that's where we're going to, Alan, we're going to let you, we'll let you start mm -hmm. closing, closing the session. We went a little bit over, but we're doing fine. And I'll say, uh, Alan is up. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks Andy. And, uh, also thanks Perry. Uh, you know, from my perspective, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Thank you for sharing your, your, uh, presentations today. Um, uh, there's no doubt that, uh, I think even the three of us are now thinking since we started 30 minute talks, in terms of technology, in terms of education, in terms of the industry um, has, has progressed and developed over that time. I want to thank all of the ICE members and the participants today. We've, uh, I think we've had a very good participation. Thank you for, for joining us. Thank you for sharing your time. Thank you for your questions and getting involved in today's conversation. We hope that if nothing else, we've initiated some thinking, some debate amongst uh, uh, the members and, and um, the ICE fraternity. And we really look forward to uh, sharing more time with you, more thoughts with you and more conversations with you. And as Perry just mentioned, one day um, being able to sit in the same room again and have a beer together. So in the meantime, keep safe, everybody. And um, uh, until next time, to you, Perry. 
Yes, absolutely. And thank you for the questions and chats. And uh, thank you, uh, Tom, for picking me up on the difference if I said uh, uh, UK instead of English universities. Yes, there's a, quite a historical difference there. So thank you for making that point. But again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we look forward to seeing a 30 minutes talks. Uh, we've nearly fit, we just went a little bit over with our 60 minutes, but uh, obviously for copyright reasons, we can't call ourselves that. Andy. You know, and, uh, again, we, we, next week on 30 Minutes, we're actually, uh, Alan, Perry, and I are uh, participating with Mahatma Gandhi University on an Asian tourism conference. And I'm going to be talking about the story of Boracay, how it went through environmental problems and now pandemic problems. Uh, Perry Perry's going to be giving an update on the Malaysian tourism industry. And Alan's going to be talking about the Australian tourism industry. So next week on 30 Minute Talks will be an interesting topic. Uh, thank you to the ICE uh, for inviting us to participate. Thank you all of you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you in the future. Be safe out there. And thank you again. Enjoy the rest of the day. And in the, in the U, if you're in the U.S., happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>